You are listening to Influencers from the Conference Board. Hello and welcome to Influencers, our marketing and communications podcast here at the Conference Board. I'm Denise Dahlhoff, Senior Researcher at the Conference Board, and recently had the opportunity to talk with Alex Heath, Managing Director and U.S. Head of Social Impact and Sustainability at Edelman during our webcast, Winning People's Trust via the Sustainability Stories We Tell. We talked about the growing expectations for companies by various stakeholders, from customers to investors to employees and beyond, to address sustainability and what that implies for telling a coherent sustainability story to these different audiences. We're excited to share the conversation with you in this podcast. Enjoy. Alex, could you begin by telling us a little bit more about yourself and your work at Edelman? Uh, sure, Denise. Thank you so much for having me today. It's great to be here and I look forward to the conversation. As you mentioned, at Edelman, I lead the U.S. Social Impact and Sustainability Team. And in this era of impact and accountability, I think the work that we do is critical for our clients. Our clients are mostly but not exclusively businesses as, as these clients strive to build multi-stakeholder value. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, personally, I've spent my whole career working on inequality and impact. The first 10 years of my career were in nonprofits and government, including service in the Peace Corps. Uh, when I lived in rural Northeast Thailand for two years, working on youth development, safe migration and human trafficking issues. After Peace Corps, I joined MTV's global anti-human trafficking campaign based in Bangkok. And that's where I found my love for the megaphone that communications offers coupled with the platform and power of business and the unique opportunity and impact that a business can make when it applies all its resources, not just financial resources, to addressing societal or environmental challenges. And so when I decided to join Edelman a while ago, uh, we were one of the few agencies that at that time had a team dedicated to what we called then CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. And over the years, we've gained expertise in a variety of areas, but most importantly for me, we've learned what builds trust and what doesn't. And that's led our team to continue to move upstream in our work, collaborating closely with clients on what action they can take and what they should take and the kind of action that authentically builds trust with audiences because of the impact that it delivers. So now we work across all industries and sectors on a wide range of issues, but all with the singular focus of helping our clients build trust with key audiences through the impact that they make. Well, that's super interesting. So it sounds like you have been really working, you know, in this field of social impact, you know, yourself in various parts of the world, and then combine that with uh, communication. So a really powerful uh, combination because you seem to really know the field. You know the issues first, you know, before uh, getting into the communication space. So when you talk about uh, social impact and sustainability, what does that exactly mean in your work? Yeah, I mean, I think your point is a really good one about impact first and communications after. But really, you know, everything we do is sort of at this intersection of impact and information. Those are really essential, the two pieces of impact and providing information. And, and for us, what, what I mean by social impact and sustainability, what we do is we build impact and purpose platforms um, and we run communications campaigns. And you know, building the platforms and the programs first is really important, and then running the communications campaigns equally important um, around topics really broad, right? Like human and public health, travel inequality, access to sport, circular economy, climate change, the global goal, sustainable finance, many more. So it really runs the gamut from social and environmental issues. Um, but what ties it all together is this idea of impact and information and, and those two prongs being essential. Okay, let's uh, maybe take a step back to even think about, you know, we are so naturally thinking about companies, you know, and corporate purpose and getting involved in the space. Why are companies so important to move uh, society forward? You know, it used to be that people look to the government mostly for those kinds of things. Yeah, right. It's traditionally the role of government to deliver to advance society. Absolutely. Um, 
So Edelman is well known for studying trust. I've mentioned it already. We have been studying trust via the trust barometer for about 22 years. Um, and the genesis of the trust barometer is actually, for me, very interesting. It came from a question that our leadership, our CEO specifically had around, if, if you all remember the battle for Seattle and the WTO uh, protests. And there was this question of why did people, why were people protesting business? And that's where the trust barometer came from. So that was, the, that was 22 years ago. Um, and over the last 22 years, we've looked at trust in four institutions, media, NGOs, government, and business. And in our most recent study in 2022, we saw that government and media are far more likely to be seen as divisive, exploiting divisions in society for commercial or political gain, and that is global, while business and NGOs are credited as unifiers. And at that same time, as, as business and NGOs are seen as unifiers and government and media are seen as divisive, business is being asked to take on, therefore, a growing responsibility for addressing societal problems. Societal leadership is now a core business function for business. And as government performance worsens, it's critical that NGOs and business step in and act as these stabilizing forces. In addition to that, we looked at these four institutions based on their level of competence. And again, you mentioned it, people used to look at government to advance society. Government is seen as not competent, nor ethical. Business is seen as 53 points more competent than government. So people are really looking at business to deliver solutions in this very fractured world that, that we live in now. So we see business as most trusted to take societal action and with high expectations that this societal action delivers real impact. Now, I think that's a lot for business to take on, but you know, it isn't new. You mentioned that people used to look at government to deliver on impact and that's true, but over the last few years, we've really seen the data around trust and expectations slowly creeping upwards for business. And I think the emergence of this idea of stakeholder capitalism, which was ratified by you know, the Business Roundtable in 2019, and all the subsequent work that we've seen over the last few years, business leaders are also ready and willing to help advance society. So I think you have these ideas of trust and expectation and leadership who is stepping into the void that we're, being seen, that we're seeing uh, from government. Uh, so that's a little bit about why we think business is really well positioned to help advance society. It sounds like there are many, you know, sort of developments coming, you know, together to bring us to where we are today. Certainly, you know, more expectations for businesses and also, you know, new responsibilities or, you know, even putting the focus more on, on these types of topics. So now, you know, we talk about purpose a lot. And so why is a clear and meaningful purpose so important in turning this corporate power and those uh, expectations by, by people around the globe into progress for society? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, look, corporate purpose is a strategy, right? So it should guide everything you do and deliver impact and build trust, action, whatever action you take, um, that's then gonna be followed by communication. Again, impact and information it's got to be grounded in and driven by purpose. It's got to be grounded in and driven by your purposeful strength. For me, authentic purposeful action sits at this strategic intersection between what a business does, so what, what do you actually do, and, and purpose is not what you do. It's sort of why you, why you exist and why you matter is what we say about purpose. And it sits at this intersection between what a business does, the impact it can have on people and planet, and the ability to bring about positive and transformative change. And so without a clear and defined purpose, I'd say businesses take action that could align to or support one or multiple stakeholder groups, right? People, you can totally take action and do things without having a codified and, and unified purpose that permeates the organization. But to really explore the essence of stakeholder capitalism in which business creates multi-stakeholder value that accrues to the bottom line over time I think that work needs to be grounded in a strong strategy. So that's really what we mean by person, by purpose, I think. Got it. So why we do the things we, we do, essentially, um, is I, I guess what you said. And so now thinking of uh, employees are a, a key stakeholder of companies. You know, they, they are without them, a company uh, wouldn't exist, of course, wouldn't get the work done. So what do employees expect of their employer in terms of purpose? 
And also, is there a connection between corporate purpose and employees' productivity? Yeah, I mean, I think that this question is, it's a really interesting one because I think what we've seen over the last few years is um, all things workplace have become material. And that wasn't always the case, right? We look at it now and we think that, as you said, without employees, the work wouldn't get done. Um, but that is a relatively, that is, that is a truism, but it's also a relatively new sort of material concept for businesses over the last couple of years. Our data shows that the expectations of employees, particularly around impact, um, are pretty high. Um, we have data that says 71% of employees say that the, the ability to make a social impact is a strong expectation or deal breaker when considering a job. In fact, you know, I was just an anecdote. I was sitting recently with the head of communications and the foundation lead uh, for a major global food and ag company. And last year, they launched a new, robust, comprehensive sustainability platform. And the data that they have from their talent acquisition team is that this platform is now the number two reason that candidates say they want to join the company. This is a huge company. They're doing all kinds of things all over the world. The number two reason that people want to join this company is because they have a really robust, comprehensive impact platform and sustainability platform. So, you know, the work is essential and doing that deep work to create the authentic platform is essential, but also you have to provide the information because how would potential employees even know about it if you didn't pair the impact with information? Um, and another you know, stat to share is that in considering a job, we see that 60% of employees expect the CEO to speak publicly about social and political issues. And, and that's a really interesting one, too, because, you know, I talked earlier about leadership. People are looking for their own CEOs or the CEO of the company that they will join to speak publicly about these. And so uh, I think it's a challenge to choose when and where to speak, but the expectations are certainly high. So that's a little bit about the expectations of employees and, and employers in, in terms of purpose. That's so interesting that you, you know, mentioned also the, <clears throat> the importance of communicating that to, um, to employees and potential employees that not just, you know, as a company, but also the role of the CEO in that. And, you know, I want to ask you a little later, how, to, how do you address all these various stakeholders at the same time about essentially the same story or the same facts, I guess? But, you know, we'll, we'll get to that uh, you know, a, a little later. <laughs> But uh, I also, you know, speaking of other stakeholders, you know, we have done some research here at the conference board together with the Harris Poll on what kinds of associations people even have with sustainability. And, you know, Alex, you mentioned earlier, you know, all the different facets of what you're looking at. What we have noticed in our research over time is that this, this definite, or these associations with sustainability sustainability have definitely broadened. Like a couple of years ago, it was really more focused on environmental dimensions. But recently, it, it's actually more going in a broader direction, including social uh, dimensions like fair labor conditions, fair wages, supporting democracy. So in the sense of being a good corporate citizen, way more broadly than just focused on the environment, and we have also seen, which is a big departure, that the driving uh, motivations to buy sustainable products are now social factors, like things like fair labor conditions, fair wages, and so forth. And that is definitely a departure from a couple of years earlier when these environmental dimensions uh, dominated. They are still important, you know, with climate change happening before our eyes, so people are still focused on that. But uh, just curious, Alex, does that, is that consistent with what you have been finding? Yes, it definitely is. I, I think people are looking to it to all institutions in a phrase to be better. And I think the last few years in the U.S., specifically with the pandemic, George Floyd's murder, the challenge to voting rights in certain states, more recent Supreme Court decisions that we've seen around Roe versus Wade, and others have they've been a great wake-up call for our country around how companies treat workers, how they engage in society. People want to work at companies, like I stated, that, that align with their values, and people want the opportunity to be engaged in impact. And 
not every consumer is looking at these issues, but those who are, we see them as engaging on the issues of the day, the issues right in front of them. So as you say, well, climate, I'd argue, is the most important issue in the world. The immediate inequalities in front of our eyes and the inequalities around wage and income, worker treatment, return to office policy, support for democracy, these are the issues that are animating people right now. And, you know, specifically, our data shows that people want more business engagement on, yes, climate change, but also specifically economic inequality, workforce reskilling, access to health care, and generally systemic injustices. So people are looking at a broad variety of social issues that they want to see business take action on. That's super interesting. Why do you think that has, I mean, apparently we both have, you know, seen this trend. Why do you think it has moved so much to this, you know, to these more social dimensions, uh, including inequality and, you know, health care and all kinds of other more social issues? I think the pandemic had a huge part to play in that. I think, you know, all of us staying at home, um, watching people dubbed as essential workers out there, um, effectively risking their health and their family's health. Uh, to continue to work and, and do their jobs, while those of us who had the privilege to continue to work but work from home and stay safe were able to do that. Um, and so I think there's just been this great awakening, um, like I said, with that coupled with the way our government has been working in the U.S. and, and some of the decisions that have been coming down from, from the court, from the highest court in the land, have, uh, you know, awoken people to these things. And, you know, Another piece that's that's interesting and has been sort of um, foundational, foundationally shaking for me is, you know, I look at some of the data that we have from our trust barometer and we asked a question around capitalism and capitalism as it exists today, does it do more harm than good in the world? And 52% of people believe globally that capitalism as it exists today does more harm than good. So you have uh, slightly more than half of our respondents, and this is a global study in 28 countries, but quite a lot of people, um, and slightly more than half are saying that actually the, the fundamental economic system that exists in a vast majority of you know the democratic countries in the world, it does more harm than good. And so when people are thinking that the economic system is not working for them and is not, uh, and is doing more harm, and they're looking at companies that are you know, workers who are perhaps not being treated the way that they should be, and people have had time to actually see that and internalize that, it's not that surprising to me that the views of different stakeholders have, have evolved over the last couple of years. And, and it makes for an ongoing and dynamic conversation in this space around how should companies act, what should they do, when should they talk about things. It's not, there's no clear, you know, one answer to these things. It's a dynamic daily conversation um, but it is certainly changing and it goes to you know what you said before it's all about trust building you know with your stories if you say that slightly more than half of the people you know don't think of capitalism in a, in a positive way i don't know whether you have seen trends for me years before whether it has deteriorated or improved uh, but that certainly you know speaks to you know the the necessity the need of more communication uh, i guess and actually continuing the conversation on uh, communicating your sustainability story, which, by, by the way, just to mention, like we at the conference board here, we have also noticed that, you know, so the, the needs of stakeholders, of different stakeholders are slightly different. For example, we have compared the motivations for consumers to buy sustainable products, which, you know, drives them the most. As I mentioned, these are the those uh, social factors, but we have also seen conservation of natural resources. But when you, on the other hand, look at what companies disclose, you know, some of them, for example, uh, on compensation or on biodiversity, that lacks a little bit, you know, what consumers essentially, what drives their, their purchase uh, motivation the most, you know, companies uh, in some cases at least report less on, which is quite interesting. But question for you, Alex, like what, what makes, what kinds of factors, what kinds of best practices makes, make uh, companies' sustainability stories heard with their audiences? Yeah, I mean, I think sustainability storytelling is a crowded space right now. 
And the simple key to it is something that we've talked about already is always ground that work in action and impact. And I think if sustainability storytelling is hard, meaning if no one wants to hear your story, then perhaps there isn't enough behind it, or it isn't unique, or it doesn't deliver enough impact, or it isn't an authentic to you as a business. I think business has a lot of space to tell great sustainability stories that will be heard. Um, but remember what we talked about around all the trust and expectation for business. And I think often business gets caught up in, in what we did instead of focusing on what we enabled and how we delivered impact. And, and that, in my experience, is what audiences want to hear. They want to hear, we do need to talk about what we did, but we can't end there. We need to talk about what we did. We need to talk about that authentic. We need to show that if we have challenges, we need to be transparent about it. People, my experience is that audiences give grace to businesses that are having challenges in this space, because if we're talking about it, nobody thinks this stuff is easy, right? And so cover, covering over or, or glossing over the challenges and just saying, all right, well, we had all those challenges. Let's just talk about like the one good thing we did. Well, that's not going to differentiate you and that's not going to give you an opportunity to tell a story to someone who's already inundated with every company trying to tell their sustainability story these days. I see the, see the earlier conversation we, we had about how business is leading and trusted and expected. And, and, and we know this and lots of businesses know this. I mean, see the rise of the chief impact officer, see the elevation of sustainability into the C-suite, into directing reporting from, you know, coming, reporting directly into the CEO, see the rise of chief diversity officers in the wake of George Floyd's murder. There's more and more of this work that's going on inside businesses. And everybody within the businesses that I engage with is professional, dedicated, focused. I, I haven't met a chief impact officer, a chief sustainability officer who is trying in any way to do anything that is you know, false or negative. Everybody is working positively towards impact. And that impact is, is, is good. The connection between impact and information is, is I think, where you're going with this question. And, and, and that's where I think businesses fall down a little bit, because often they think that what they did, I mean, I was recently reviewing some sustainability reports, and I looked at it, and I read this whole sustainability report, and I thought, I, I, don't, I don't know this company. I just happened to be looking at their sustainability report. I don't know the people inside. But I know from experience that reading that sustainability report, what they've what they've delivered, what they're doing, what they've accomplished was very hard and admirable. But the way they told the story was fine. You, you, you know, it's going to be, you look at that and say, well, that's what's expected of you now because the expectations have changed. And so you need to tell your story about the, the process. What was hard about it? Where transparency? What did you learn? Um, and then what did you enable and how did you deliver impact? Uh, because that's what audiences want to hear. They want to learn from you. They want to be inspired by you. Everybody's reporting now. Everybody's delivering on, you know, certain ESG metrics, however you want to talk about it. Everybody's looking at that. So really it's how do you tell your stories in a way that differentiates? And, and again, just to reiterate, I think it's really about talking about what you did, doing that transparently, sharing learnings, and then focusing on what you enable and how you deliver. Well, I, I thought this was super interesting what you said about uh, transparency and especially uh, the perception of authenticity to not just report, you know, all the, the positive things or everything that went so well and the accomplishments, but also the failures, what is still not going well, <clears throat> the process behind the scenes, what was the struggle and so forth. So people can appreciate it. And I really love the authenticity angle also to, it sounds like you're, you're saying to break through the clutter, right? Because everything looks like a, like a high gloss kind of report, you know, everything is fine and, and dandy. But, you know, as a communication specialist, how do you see that? How do you, do, do you think it's, it, it, it's, it's easy for companies to make that step to be so transparent that they are talking about their, you know, what went wrong? Like, what does it take to get companies to, to get there? No, it's not easy because there, there are, there's nuance to it because there's some risks, perhaps. Um, but I think the risks are not always as high as maybe our clients think they are. 
Um, I, I think that it would, you know, those who share transparently do get do get the credit for it, right? Um, I think there's a lot of learning that is shared, and that doesn't have to be we messed up. It can just be, you know, here's why we haven't reached our goals, and there are certain reasons for that, and so we're gonna, you know, do something differently next time, right? And you're starting to see more and more of that. So I don't think it's easy, but I do think more and more companies are doing that. Um, and so I think, yeah, it is about that authenticity and that breaking through. And I think the other piece is, of course, right, when we talk about stake, uh, sustainability storytelling, we do have to bring up the idea of purpose washing or green washing. Um, and that's a challenge, too, because if you get if you get out ahead of yourself, if you overweight information versus impact, you could be at risk of greenwashing. And again, to my earlier point, I think when we see people who are accused of greenwashing, I don't think that the people who did that started out with a goal of greenwashing. I think they started out with a goal of telling stories more quickly. And perhaps they told those stories quickly without delivering all of the impact or without taking the time to do that. So this is, you know, like I said before, it's complex. It takes time. Um, but just being aware of those things is really important. Being aware of this idea that, yes, you've done hard work. So have all of your peers. Some people are being more transparent than others. What, what, tra- what level of transparency is authentic to you? It doesn't have to be, you know, total transparency. What level of, authentic, of transparency is authentic? How would you and your leadership feel comfortable being on? Um, and then are we delivering the impact that is equivalent to the communications that we are sharing? And are we communicating equivalent to the impact that we're delivering? And I think those are some principles to think about when we're thinking about sustainability storytelling. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, it probably takes a lot of courage from com- uh, from companies to to be so transparent, to admit also, you know, that the... the the not so shiny sides of you know the story, but you know again it sounds like there is also there are many benefits uh, associated with that. I wanted to comment on what you said about greenwashing. Actually, we talked about that this week at the conference board because our colleagues uh, from the Sustainability Center just uh, released a report on exactly that topic, greenwashing, and it's we came to the same conclusion uh, what what you just mentioned that it's not an intentional, you know, or often it's not intentional, but it's to simplify a story, to give, for example, consumers like a very easy peer when you say green or ecological or something better for you. But what does that really mean? And what our colleagues have also pointed out in their report is that this calling out for greenwashing is becoming more frequent because people pay more attention now And, you know, so companies, there's a lot for companies to learn. Again, it might not be bad intentions, but, you know, people have to also know the, I guess, the the legal frameworks around all these these topics. But uh, going back to this, to telling your sustainability story, one key question in this area is, you know, considering all these uh, different stakeholders with their different needs from from investors to employees to consumers to the general public, how do you tell your sustainability story in a coherent way and make this effective with all of the different uh, audiences and you know have relevant information and you know have it tailored to their to their needs? Yeah, I think in general, I think we're trying to build trust with each audience. But each audience requires a slightly different approach to building. The consistent elements are clear goals, transparency about how we aim to reach those goals, our progress against them, and if we fall short, what will we do to achieve them? So for investors, for example, this could be about a DEI strategy and an approach to creating a more diverse and inclusive workforce. For current employees, this could be about the organization's approach to climate for the organization's approach to gender equity, both hot button issues that have seen employee activism campaigns rise up in the last few years. For potential talent, this could be about the organization's broader ESG goals, like the, uh, uh, you know, stated clearly with ambition and a clear plan to achieve that ambition, like the global food and ag company who's seeing a lift in interest from their ESG platform. So I think you have some principles, but they need to be executed specifically 
uh, to those audiences to reach them with messages and information that they want to hear. So that also means from, from what I'm hearing or think I'm hearing is that you wouldn't even raise every topic with every audience. You would pick the, the topic, you would tailor the message, you would tailor the channel and, and everything else that needs to be tailored to get the, the message across. I, I think, you know, the global companies that we're talking about are working on so many issues that, yeah, you can't raise every issue with every audience. So the work that you're doing, you have to pick and choose and you, you have to pick and choose or you should pick and choose the impact you deliver. I mean, you're looking at the investments that you're making across these areas and deciding, are you going to focus on different environmental issues? Are you going to focus on different social issues? Where are you picking and choosing your investments? And in the same way, you have to think about targeted storytelling to build trust with the audiences around the impact that you're delivering. And to your earlier point on greenwashing and that, and that storytelling needs to be nuanced and complex enough to show the impact, but in a responsible way so that you're not overly simplifying in a way that's going to say, this is green or sustainable when it, it might not reach that level of green or sustainable in reality, but it is perhaps an incremental shift that you've made in your company that is moving towards something that is better for the planet. And so it has to be a little bit more nuanced, but who needs to hear that where and on what channel and from whom is the way we need to think about telling those stories. Actually, one, one other question for you, since you're so close to, you know, you're closely working with businesses, you, you're, you have so much experience and background in this area. Can you highlight any examples of companies or cases that are doing a really good job at this telling your sustainability story? Uh, I don't want to make you pick your favorites, but you know everybody can learn from examples, but just even highlighting some aspect of what <clears throat> certain companies are doing really well in this space, if you have any examples to share that you can share. Sure, I think there's quite a few really good examples out there. I think you know, from a general always on communications and, you know, from a corporate and brand perspective, I think you know, most people in our field would agree that Unilever is doing a really nice job on their sustainability impact work and the communications that they share so that people understand that they are doing, they're delivering um, impact across their footprint. I think that, you know, Starbucks, when they launched their Planet Positive work a couple of years ago, they've done a really nice job and they have a lot of powerful storytelling around their sustainability, which is really nice to see. I think PepsiCo is doing really interesting work around water right now and, and agriculture. And they're doing a very good job on, on sustainability storytelling. And HP is another one that comes to mind. Doing, doing a nice job around some story, storytelling, uh, you know, around some recycled materials that they're using in their supply chain um, and some other, uh, you know, work they're doing around uh, forestry and, and sustainability and commitments and, you know, work that they did with some of their supply chain and some of their channel partners to elevate and, and expand their sustainability goals to others w was really helpful. So just a couple off the top of my head. Not all of those clients of ours, some of them that I'm just seeing in the space, uh, but a couple of thoughts that I had. Yeah. Great. And so one other question about, you know, the delivery of the story. Um, do, have you seen any data or do you have any anecdotal uh, evidence even of whether the trust and how your sustainability story is received? Does that vary with the channel that you use or the platform or the media? Like, I'm thinking, I don't know, you mentioned that shiny report that you read, you know, compared to maybe with a video or a social media or something else. Like, do you know from your work, like, any any differences in terms of impact? Yeah, I mean, generally, we do have data on that, not specific to storytelling. Sorry, not specific to sustainability, but specific to storytelling. From our data this year, it shows that, quote, my employer is now the most trusted entity in the world. And even more relevant here for this question is that my employer media is the most believable. So 65% of employers say that their employer media is 
either to be believed immediately or they only need to see that information once or twice to believe it. And contrast that with only 38% of people trust their social media feed to tell them the truth. So I think in short, we can agree that social media is the least trusted channel for people to get their information. But importantly, it's not only about spokesperson, it's not only about channels, but it's also about spokespeople. And the most distrusted people to share messages are, no surprise from what we talked about earlier, government leaders. But then the other two are really interesting to me. Journalists, very distrusted. And CEOs as a class are distrusted. But the most trusted in order are scientists, my coworkers, and my CEO. So CEOs in general are not trusted, but my CEO is very trusted. And so just to make that, remake that point about employer media and communications to employees, we talked earlier about how important employer employees are. Mm -hmm. Employer media is really trusted, and my CEO is really trusted. And so when you think about the channels and the spokesperson, that's those two things come together with obviously the the, the core of the impact and the action that we're delivering, um, how we get that out to the out to the audiences that we're talking about. Great. And one final question for you, um, Alex. Um, if you could leave our listeners with one thought about how to win people's trust through the sustainability stories they tell. What would that be? Yeah, I go back to what I hit upon earlier, Denise. Action drives trust, and action is the only way to deliver impact. Audiences across stakeholder groups trust business to take action and deliver impact, and they expect business to take action and deliver impact. And so they trust and expect living up to those expectations can result in great gains in trust. And trust in these uncertain times is really shaping up to be the currency of the realm. And to prosper in this age of stakeholder capitalism, I think companies have to actively cultivate the trust of employees, investors, customers, regulators, corporate partners, any other stakeholders. That requires developing strategies to understand those stakeholders more intimately, implementing deliberate trust building actions, tracking those efforts over time, and communicating openly and effectively with key stakeholder groups. So in short, I think trust is built at the intersection of impact and information, deliver action, tell people about it, and trust will come. So that's what I would leave with you with today. Thank you very much, Alex, for sharing your interesting insights on creating and telling a company's sustainability story And thank you as well to our listeners for joining us today. We'll see you on the next episode of Influencers. This has been Influencers from the Conference Board.